fun. It's just a romantic comedy, and it, you don't really, un, you have to have a suspension of disbelief for how society can entirely forget different segments of society, but we, the whole world does forget. It's, it no longer exists, the Beatles. There are a few other things that don't exist, including Coca-Cola. So when he asks for a Coke, it seems like he's asking for hard drugs. And, um, and Harry Potter. And cigarettes don't exist in this world, entirely forgotten. So they, um, he Googles these things, just like you see, and he tries to understand why it has been forgotten, and he doesn't know what has happened. See, he was just a guy, Jack Malik. He lived on the southern coast of England. He had a good group of friends. He, was, he has a good voice, a decent songwriter, so-so. His songs that his friends liked, they showed up to his little concerts, and um, they cheered for him. But uh, he was not Paul McCartney or John Lennon, for sure, or the lead guy from Coldplay, whose name I forget. He wasn't any of those. He wasn't... Was it any of those guys? A uh, guy living a good life, and he'd do music festivals, and there'd be like four people in a tent because he'd be on the side tent where the the lead person was somewhere else. And then there is this power power outage across the entire world for twelve seconds, and in those twelve seconds, collectively. Our universe has forgotten the Beatles, Harry Potter, cigarettes, and Coca-Cola that he's discovered at this point. And um, in the midst of the power outage, all the lights go out, a bus hits him, as you saw. He lands, he loses his two front teeth, he, but otherwise he's okay, he's recovering. His, um, he had his guitar on his back. He was riding his bike because he doesn't even have a driver's license. He's kind of, he lives at home. He isn't what you'd call like a success. He hasn't really moved on and uh, become financially self-sustaining and he's closer to 30. So um, that's what he does. He's a music guy that lives in his parents' basement and pretty happy and doesn't realize the woman who loves him loves him. And so he's just kind of going along and his um, guitar flies off and it, it gets smashed by the bus. So his friends feel bad for him. They buy him a new guitar. And they're at, I think I have a picture of that. They're sitting at... Um, yeah, they're sitting there. They give him the guitar. They, you saw that in the video clip. And he just picks it up like any guitar players. You start playing the song, you know. And so yesterday's one of those songs he plays all the time. And they're like, wait, when did you write this song? He's like, I didn't write this song. Paul McCartney wrote this song. Who? And the, and the whole thing. And he starts like playing other Beatles music, and they don't know it. And he realizes that nobody can remember, nobody knows the entire Beatles catalog. And it's interesting because, because it's been destroyed. There's no sheet music. There are no recordings. He even goes to his um, record collection, and he pull, gets to the Bs, and the Beatles don't exist there. They don't exist as a, as a band. It, it, they never made it. And so he has to begin to remember all of the Beatles music, anything he could remember. And so... You see him like trying to think through, now, what are the words of Sergeant Pepper? And how, what was that chord? And he has to do it all from memory. And he is just um, goofing around in his local pub where he plays some shows, and Ed Sheeran hears him. And Ed Sheeran's manager hears him. And they hear these songs, and they think, you could be something. Now, Ed Sheeran's manager is like, but you're ugly. So you have to come to Hollywood, and I have to remake you. And then you have to sing these songs, and then you'll make a lot of money, and I'll take a lot of that, and I'll make a lot of money. But this is going to be the way this is. This is what you want, right? So he gets on a plane, he goes to Hollywood, and he's remade, and he gets new front teeth and uh, his hair kind of styled. And... He um, is the opening act for Ed Sheeran's tour, and people love these songs. They love them, and he 
keeps trying over and over to tell people, this isn't me. This isn't, I didn't write this music. And people just aren't understanding that. This isn't one of those movies where by the end it's like, oh, you find out the guy was lying the whole time. Like, he actively tries to tell people that, that, that this isn't him. But he's living in a world where people don't know, don't remember who the Beatles are or were. He's living in a world where people don't know Harry Potter. I wonder how many people sitting here might think, oh, if I lived in that world, you don't have access to any of the books, any of the movies, could you rewrite it <laughs> and make all the money? Could you, or like, how would you change it? Like, hey, Jude to hey, dude, come on. That's bad. What would happen differently? You're not supposed to ask questions when you're preaching, then, like, you start doing, answering the questions. Are there good, good things you'd change? <laughs> More representation. Oh, you'd have some queer folks in Harry Potter. Yeah. That's what Hope Church is saying. That's awesome. <laughs> All right. So uh, that's kind of what he's um, faced with. That's what, what he gets to do is recreate from his mind everything that he can remember about the Beatles. He goes to Hollywood. He becomes famous. He starts making money. And he's singing some of these songs, and he, it's not who he is, so it's hard for him to have, because they say to him, you don't seem to have the heart and soul for this. So he flies to Liverpool, thinking that if he just hangs out in Liverpool, that he can, he can get it. It's like if all of us got on a plane right now and flew to Jerusalem right now. Would that make all of us deeply committed, faithful people? Now, there is something to it. There is some sense of awareness and a deeper understanding. One year ago today, I was actually at Liverpool's Pride Fest with my family. So I do, it's not that I'm above making spiritual pilgrimages. And yes, I do consider trips to Liverpool spiritual pilgrimages. <laughs> <laughs> but they, um, it doesn't make you... John Lennon. It does not make you Paul McCartney. I do think that Sean was Ringo Starr, but he said absolutely not, that he's not claiming that. Um, so he's, he's trying to figure out who he is. Has that ever happened to you? When you were around a particular group of people, or you were told things by friends or family, or you had experiences in your life, and you just sort of forget who you are? You start acting in a different way. And deep down, you know who it is you are. Deep down, underneath it all, you can figure out your Jack Malik or whoever you uniquely have been created to be. But what do we do in those times where we forget who we are? Those are the times we usually start making bad choices, right? Now, I just want to say to any of our teenagers here, when you are an adolescent, you haven't forgotten who you are. You're learning who you are. And really into college, you're learning who you are. So there are some things that we try on. We're like, ah, nope, that is not it. And we step away, and then we step back, and every person in here can relate to that. And um, we are so grateful to be the old pastor here at Hope Church. So we... Uh, there, some of that is natural and normal and what should happen and what we absolutely encourage to happen. But there are times where we know, we know deep down who we are and who we've always been created to be. That's, you know, that's part of why we wanted this congregation, so that everyone can be who they've known that they were created to be. Everyone can be who they were created to be because um, we start... Treating those we love um, in ways that don't build relationship when we are not acting in who we are. We start making poor choices for what we should do for our jobs or our recreation or um, all, all that we are. And when we start acting fake, it affects the relationships we have and ultimately it affects the community we're in. 
in Deuteronomy, uh, we hear the story of the Exodus again. It's in Exodus, it's in Deuteronomy, and um, listen to this. This is when the Israelites forgot who they are. This is the first chapter. Then as the Lord our God commanded us, we set out from Horeb and went toward the hill country of the Amorites through all that vast and dreadful wilderness that you have seen, and we reached Kadash Berean. And I said to you, you have reached the hill country of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. See, the Lord your God has given you the land. Go up and take possession of it as the Lord your God of your ancestors told you. Don't be afraid. Don't be discouraged. What should have happened at that point? It's yours. You've been living a life of slavery. You have been enslaved as people. And now I am offering you freedom. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. What should happen next? You should just walk right into that freedom, right? Then all of you came back to me. This is Moses talking and said, let us in, and please know when I say this is Moses talking, I don't believe Moses wrote Deuteronomy because Moses' death is described. He didn't write this in, after he died. This is the uh, biblical authors that are retelling this narrative. Then all of you came back to me and said, let us send men ahead to spy out the land for us and bring back a report about the route we are to take and the towns we'll come to. The idea seemed good to me. Moses said. So I selected 12 of you, one man from each tribe. They left and went up to the hill country and came to the va valley of Eshkol and explored it, taking with them some of the fruit of the land. They brought it to us and reported, it's a good land the Lord is giving us. Okay, so now you've had spies go look. They've brought back delicious food and said, this is good. What should happen now? They should head into freedom. What does happen? But you were unwilling to go up. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You grumbled in your tents and said, the Lord hates us. So he brought us out of Egypt to deliver us into the hands of Amorites to destroy us. Where can we go? Our brothers have made our hearts melt in fear. They say, the people are stronger and taller than we are. It almost sounds kind of whiny. The people are stronger and taller than we are. I don't think it was because they were facing real danger, but that's just how I'm reading it today. <laughs> the cities are large. The walls up to the sky. We even saw the Anakites there. Then I said, do not be terrified. Do not be afraid of them. The Lord your God is going before you, will fight for you as he did for you in Egypt before your very eyes. And in the wilderness there you saw how the Lord your God carried you as a father carries a son all the way you went until you reached this place. In spite of this, you did not trust the Lord your God. Jen, will you put verse 26 back up? But you were unwilling to go up. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. You were unwilling to go up. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. Now that word rebelled, I want to talk about for a second. You rebelled. When we think about someone rebelling, we usually think of that in terms of someone who's being ornery or naughty or doing, making a bad choice that they know is a bad choice. Um, we use that to talk about our rebellious years where um, we were disrespectful to our parents or to those around us. But I want to give a little bit more compassion here for these people. They were legitimately scared. They were being offered freedom, and they were legitimately scared. And even there, there was proof that it was going to be okay. They knew. They knew the dangers that lied before them. And they were legitimately scared. You rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. When Today, we, on another day, we may think about that verb rebel differently. But today I want to talk about it in terms of rebelling because they forgot who they are. They forgot who they are. They forgot what they were a part of. And that's what happened. 
It is when we remember who we are that we can fully live into who God is creating us to be. I don't know if any of you have ever taken a career path where you knew that your family was not going to support it, and um, you had it lined out before you. This is what you can do, but you needed to go back to your family and say, this is what I'm going to do. And you know in your heart of hearts that God will be there with you and that that's who you were created to be. You're not complaining about tall walls or strong men or whatever. But you've thought through all of the things that your family's going to say to you about why you shouldn't do that thing. Or uh, certainly anyone who has a story of coming out has thought through all of the things that your family's going to say. And it's hard for any of us to say, don't worry, your family won't say that, because families say the things. You run into all of the problems. All of a sudden, it's not just whiny complaints. The things actually happen. Or you're dating someone, and you know that that is not the person you should be dating. You know in your heart of hearts that that is not the right relationship for you, and you, are, you have forgotten who you are in the midst of that relationship. And you need to remember who you are. It's not an open rebellion kind of situation. It sometimes was for the right reasons, because you wanted to get along, because you didn't want to cause waves, because you didn't want to hurt anyone. Sometimes we stay like the Israelites do, comfortable in our tents and not into full freedom because there are risks and there are dangers in being fully who you are. And then when you're fully who you are, there will be people who will reject that person, right? But when you're fully who you are, you experience a freedom that you do not experience when you're putting on a mask or being fake. When you're fully who you are, you experience a freedom. That's what these Israelites were being offered, freedom. Now, for them, it was, there was, they were enslaved as a people and being required to, uh, with very limited freedom for what they could do. So freedom meant all kinds of things. But we can become enslaved in our mind and in our emotions and in our thoughts and we're reminded that we were created by God in the image of the divine every single person in this room was created in the image of the divine Jack Malik, he uh he's created he's a great kid he was a great person he was not Paul McCartney and you know the whole time he was trying to be it was very frustrating for him. He was never who he was meant to be, and he was never going to be open to the relationships and the depth of love that he could receive until he got on the other side of that. There's a point in time where um, he's just become so popular, and they want to uh, they want to come up with a way to let the whole world know about Jack Malik and all his songs, and he's like got a way. Uh, how about a rooftop concert at Abbey Road? As if this is, and they're like, wow, psh, great idea. And he goes out there and uh, sings, and there's all those people. But then he sees, it's a romantic comedy, really, at its heart. So you know, I won't spoil it, but you know what's going to happen in the coming scenes. And he remembers who he is. I, um, I don't think that the Beatles' music are gospel by any stretch of the imagination, but it was fun to get to look at uh, the, what God says to us through this lens. And I want to watch just a couple minutes of the James Corbin, Paul McCartney road trip, what, what's it called? Carpool karaoke. You know, there are lots and lots of these. The Second most popular carpool karaoke has something like 26 million views. This one had 44 million views. When I checked it this morning, it was 44.3 million, and I did not make up a million of these views. <laughs> Only a few of them. Well, let's, uh, 
Let's take a look at James talking to Paul McCartney. They're actually driving through Liverpool while Paul remembers who he is. No. James has obviously become very popular. He still had to remember who he was in the midst of that time. All of a sudden, he's reminded of his childhood and how the influence of his dad and his grandpa led him even to this moment. Friends, I invite us to begin to or to re-remember who we are. We don't have to be anyone else. We're created in the image of God, Genesis 1, 27. And behold, it was very good. Exactly who you were created to be is who we all want you to be. It's who God wants you to be. And so I invite you, don't try to pretend to be someone you are. Don't try to do what someone else did, write Harry Potter or write the Beatles music or whatever else might be forgotten by others. What is it you've been invited to write, to create, to be, to do? That's, that's who we're invited into as people of faith. And when we forget and when we want to rebel against being who we are, we're in good company. Good, strong, faithful people forgot who they were, and God never left them. God stayed by their side, and when they were ready to remember, they still got to be a part of it with God. And so um, let it be. We'll invite the band.